Hello, and thank you for joining me today to talk about how AWS can help you get a jump start on your migration to SaaS. My name is Michael Beardsley. I'm a solutions architect at AWS on a team called the SaaS Factory. The SaaS Factory is a group of business and technical professionals who help our partners and customers with best practices on running multi-tenant SaaS workloads on AWS. As we've worked with hundreds of our ISV partners over the years, it's clear that our customers want an easier, more prescriptive way to move existing workloads to a SaaS delivery model. Many of you may find yourself in the example that we see here on this slide, where you have lots of customers using your application, but each of them is in their own installation. And with that, we get a lot of challenges. Often those installations drift in terms of versions of what's supported and what's not. Usually you've got different deployment pipelines. Sometimes you even have different support staff supporting these different installations. And what that does is that impacts your ability to be agile and it really slows down and impacts your ability to scale and bring on new customers. And so what we're looking for is a way to move to a true SaaS environment where you have this unified space where all of your customers are running the same version of your software. And then that environment is surrounded by all the things that we traditionally look at in a SaaS environment, things like tenant onboarding, monitoring, metrics. So the challenge that we have is how can we move you uh, from where we are today to this unified SaaS environment? How can we do it quickly? How can we minimize the impacts to your existing application so that you can meet market demands or competitive pressures that you might be facing to get to SaaS? Well, I'm excited to be able to talk to you today about a new open source reference environment that we call AWS SaaS Boost. SaaS Boost creates an experience where you can take your existing single tenant applications, install it into the environment in very few steps, hopefully without changing your source code at all, and then provide your product to the marketplace to your customers as a SaaS model. That gives you time to then iterate, learn, and evolve and follow your product roadmap as a SaaS vendor. Let's walk the high level experience of SaaS Boost. So like I said, we're open sourcing SaaS Boost. So you're gonna start by cloning the source code repository, and then you're gonna go through an installation experience that gets the SaaS Boost environment installed into your AWS account. Once SaaS Boost is installed, you've got to configure it so it knows how to support your workload for your tenants. And then you need to provide your application to SaaS Boost as a Docker containerized image. Once your application is uploaded and you've got SaaS Boost configured, it's ready to help you onboard new tenants. And then once your customers are using your new SaaS product, then SaaS Boost gives you the tools to manage those as a true SaaS vendor. So what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together is go under the hood, so to speak, and look at some of the details of how we built SaaS Boost uh, and what's going on behind the scenes so that you can understand how it can help you. Let's start by taking a look at uh, the footprint of what actually gets installed when you put SaaS Boost into your account. So here's a view that we have. You can see that SaaS Boost is made up of a bunch of microservices. And uh, we worked hard at using serverless technologies to build SaaS Boost. And we did that to help minimize the cost, the, the sort of overhead to you of having the SaaS Boost environment running, supporting your workload. So you'll see that all of our microservices are built using Lambda functions. And then what we've done is we have created an administrative UI experience, a web UI that we wrote in React. And that admin console is hosted in Amazon S3 with a CloudFront distribution in front of it. Now React communicates with those microservices through an API gateway. 
And that API gateway marshals the requests and responses back and forth to those Lambda functions to the front end. There's also a couple of optional modules that you can choose to install with SAS Boost. You don't have to, but we have a billing uh, module and we have an analytics ingestion pipeline that you can choose to install into the account. And of course, your application is a big part of what gets installed with SAS Boost. So your application is in there and it will communicate with these different APIs to take advantage of their features. So what do we mean when we say configure your application? Well, we need to tell SAS Boost how to support your application's workload. So things like what operating system is it running? Uh, what kind of compute resources is it going to need? What do you want the auto scaling groups to look like? And maybe other extensions to the compute environment, things like databases, maybe file storage. So there's, all these pieces that we have to collect information about. And we've written a microservice that we call the settings microservice that manages all these configuration settings. And to do that, what the settings service does is it uses the parameter store feature of AWS Systems Manager. And parameter store gives us an inexpensive key value data store that also supports encryption of secrets. There's also some of these settings that come to life as part of installing SAS Boost in the first place. So now that you've got SAS Boost installed and you've got it configured, you need to get your application up into SAS Boost so that we can deploy it to all your tenants. So today you have some sort of deployment pipeline. Uh, it might not be automated, it might be, there may be a mix of manual and automated steps, but it follows something along the lines of these blue boxes that you see up here. You've got to build your app, you've got to take it through its testing cycles, and then you deploy it. And for SAS Boost, uh, you're going to have to run your app as a Docker uh, image. And if you're not currently running your app as a Docker container, then that's a step that you're going to have to take uh, to be able to use SAS Boost. Now creating a Docker image, it's not that difficult, um, but there are some nuances, especially if you think about uh, getting a Windows image running correctly. Um, and there are ways that you can minimize the uh, size of your image and really tweak things for a small size, which helps minimize your costs of storing it in the registry and, and how fast it spins up when you, when you launch it. Um, but for SAS Boost, all you're really going to have to do is you're going to have to change this last step here, this deployment step uh, in your existing pipeline. Now that may sound scary, but it's really just four standard Docker commands. So these are Docker commands that any Docker workload would run. And you start with authenticating against the registry where you're going to store your image, then you build your image, you tag it for that repo, and then you upload your image to the repo using the Docker push command. So your deployment step could literally be as simple as the shell commands that you see on the screen here. Automated tenant onboarding is probably one of the biggest value propositions of SAS Boost. And it's a really big process, so we're gonna go into some detail uh, over all the different parts of it, but let's start with an overview so we understand what we're talking about here. So either as an administrator logged into that admin web application that we talked about, that React application, or if you choose, you could integrate directly to the SAS Boost API with some existing registration flow in your app. But either way, you trigger an onboarding request. And the onboarding microservice then takes that request and it uh, orchestrates a whole series of steps that happen from creating the tenant, provisioning all the infrastructure, and getting your application deployed to that new tenant's infrastructure. So let's look at some of the details. So we start with uh, creating a new tenant. So the very first thing that the onboarding service does is it delegates to the tenant microservice to save that tenant record and create a unique identifier for that tenant. And then the onboarding service collects up all of the uh, settings that you configured as part of configuring SAS Boost, as well as any specific settings that you may have chosen for a given tenant. And it triggers the provisioning process using AWS CloudFormation. 
Now, obviously, as soon as you've got more than one tenant, you got to figure out how to route requests to the proper uh, unique environment for each of those tenants. You can't have one tenant logging in and seeing somebody else's workloads. So the way that we deal, deal with that in SAS Boost is with subdomains. So this is often referred to as using vanity domains. And these are simply alias records that are pinned against the hosted zone that we have in Route 53 for your application. So many of you might be using vanity domains today with your customers to route them to their uh, proper installations. So what are extensions then? Well, every tenant environment that comes to life in SAS Boost is provisioned as a secure, scalable, VPC isolated compute environment. And that may be enough for your workload, but there are many workloads out there that need more than just compute, uh, the most common of which is a database. So if you need a relational database, or if you need a shared file system, say your application manages documents for your customers and you need to be able to upload files and have them download them, then what we've done uh, to start with is to support Amazon Aurora, both MySQL and Postgres compatible engines, as well as the rest of the engines available in RDS. And for file shares, we've got uh, EFS, the Elastic File System Service, for Linux-based workloads using the NFS protocol. And for Windows workloads, we've integrated with Amazon FSx for Windows shares. So at the end of the day, extensions are really just parameterized cloud formation templates that optionally get lit up with the tenant onboarding system when you have told SAS Boost that your workload requires one of these extensions. And you can see how there are many future ideas of what we could extend the SAS Boost compute environment with. So we're excited about the future. Now the tenant onboarding flow goes through lots of different stages, uh, and we need to be able to monitor that and understand where the request is in its processing. And so let's walk through all of those steps right now. So like I said before, we start with creating the new tenant. Uh, and as soon as we've got that unique identifier, we say that the onboarding request is in a created state. The next phase then is to trigger those cloud formation templates to provision all the infrastructure. So we then say that the onboarding request is in the provisioning state. Now, what we've done is we've set up an a simple notification service topic that's listening for those cloud formation stacks, however many of them there are, if there's extensions, there's more than one, to finish. And when those stacks complete, SNS then uh, moves us over into what we call the provision state, because all the resources are provisioned, and it triggers a Lambda function that then goes through and collects up all the unique attributes of those new resources that just got created. So for example, every tenant environment comes to life with an application load balancer to sit in front of the workload. Well, we need the ID for that ALB for other features in the product. So this Lambda function will collect up that and a whole bunch of other stuff and save it with the tenant information. And once it's done with that, it will then trigger the deployment workflow to get your application running in this new tenant environment. So, Lambda will trigger code pipeline, and code pipeline then, now we're in the deployment stage, the deploying stage, and code pipeline will run through a handful of phases, and it's going to trigger Elastic Container Service, ECS, to do what's called a rolling deployment. So that's gonna create a new task definition for your Docker image and get it running behind a scalable service. Now, once ECS is all done and the workload is up on the network and accessible and we're completely done, we have event bridge listening to pipeline. And when code pipeline is finished, then the onboarding request is done and we end in the deployed state. And now that tenant is ready to consume your application through SAS Boost. Let's talk about another big value prop that is included to get you operating more as a SaaS vendor. So when you're running a subscription service, your customers expect to be able to get 
upgrades and new features and bug fixes without going through some big traditional upgrade process where maybe they have to uninstall an old version to install the new one or sign a new contract or anything like that. That's one of the, that's one of the reasons why customers want SaaS from their, from their vendors. And for you, the more you work with a single set of artifacts, the more agile you become and the more cost efficient you become. Well, that can be really challenging, as we talked about early on, in a traditional deployment model where you have all these different environments that you've got to manage configurations for and get deployment pipelines working with. Well, now with SAS Boost, continuous deployment, which is the CD in CI-CD that everybody likes to talk about, finally becomes a reality. All you do is you push your latest version of your application up to ECR in the SAS Boost account. And then what we've done is we've created a cloud native architecture whereby EventBridge is listening to ECR for new image pushes. And then it's going to trigger a Lambda function that's going to go through and find all the tenants that are active and ready for your latest event, your latest version of your application. And then just as when you initially onboarded that tenant, then we're going to trigger the deployment pipelines for each of those tenants. And then here's your payoff. With you simply uploading your latest version to ECR, SAS Boost will take care of automatically deploying that latest copy to every single one of your active tenants, and you didn't have to do anything else to support that. Now we all know that tenants come in different shapes and sizes, and they consume your application, and they produce a load on the infrastructure behind it in different ways. We also know that a lot of SaaS vendors package their product offerings up in combinations of features and functionality that we often call tiering. So you might have a premium tier that has more resources, uh, or you might have a free trial tier, for example. So let's talk about how SaaS Boost would support these varying loads and these product packaging ideas. Well, you saw how easy it was to configure SaaS Boost in the first place to be ready to support your application. Well, really what you're doing here in a way is you're defining a default tier. Because if you don't change anything, every tenant you onboard is going to inherit these default settings. Now, if you needed to change something or you wanted to create a different tier for packaging purposes, you could choose to override these settings when you onboard the tenant or after the fact, you can go and edit them. So imagine you have a really big customer that is much larger than all of your normal customers, and you know they're gonna need more compute resources and maybe a bigger scaling group to be able to be satisfied. Well, SAS Boost allows you to set that up uh, and gives you the features to support these SAS uh, models. So not only, do we need to be able to light up a new tenant and provide our application to them through this SaaS model with automated deployments, which we can do now, we need to be able to operate this at runtime. And so we have some operational tools that we've made available that give you insights into your code without you having to do anything. You don't have to reprogram anything, you don't have to touch your source code, and you're gonna get consumption trends, you're gonna get insights into where there might be opportunities to tune a tenant environment. Maybe you over-provision for a tenant and you can see that they're not using all the resources, so you could save a little money by scaling that down a bit, or maybe you need to give a tenant a little bit more. You're also going to now have a mechanism where you can trigger customer success properties of a SaaS vendor, right? So it, as you see a tenant accessing a certain feature of your workload, maybe that's time to make a warm touch call to them from customer success. Maybe it's an opportunity for an upsell. So we now have this ability to see all of these runtime operational things in a single pane of glass across your entire customer base. You're also going to be able to see unexpected errors and be able to debug and, and figure out what's going on and fix those if they got through testing and you didn't know that they were there. So how are we doing all this without you having to touch your source code? Well, ECS, 
produces all kinds of metrics about the infrastructure that is running your containerized application, and it pushes all that information over to CloudWatch metrics. Part of how ECS works is it integrates with the Elastic Load Balancing Service to put a front door to your uh, application for each tenant environment. And those load balancers are publishing their access and error logs to S3. So what we've done is we've put an Amazon Athena table on top of that S3 data so that we can query against it. And then our metrics microservice is gathering up that data from CloudWatch and from Athena, aggregating it, normalizing it, and publishing it out to the admin UI, where now you've got these real-time dashboards that you can slice and dice by tenant, by entry point into your application, or by time. As well as these no-touch operational insights into your workloads, we have other tools that help you operate your SaaS environment. So in the admin console for SAS Boost, there are ways to manage the tenant lifecycle. You can disable tenants so they can't access the workload. You can enable them. You can deal with their billing subscriptions. Obviously, you get all the automated deployments. But you also have uh, tenant context uh, logs, debug logs. So all the application logs for a given tenant environment go into a separate CloudWatch log group for each tenant. Uh, and that enables you to go in and debug uh, and see what's going on from your application logs. Now we you know, put some time into being security conscious. And so things like database passwords and API keys, stuff like that, those are all stored as encrypted secrets and they're passed to the containers as encrypted secrets. There's also some of the communication that happens between the microservices on the back end is really private API calls. It's not stuff that was ever intended for uh, the consumer or the public to reach or, or that React application to reach. So we have a private API back there that's protected by a signature v4 authorization with IAM. The other thing you're gonna to get to help you operate in this new SaaS environment is some cost transparency. So one of the things we do when we light up all these resources for these tenants is we tag those resources with that unique tenant identifier. And because this is all running in your AWS account for all of your customers, now you can go into the billing section for that account and slice and dice those billing light items by that tenant ID and see who's costing what. So let's wrap up by talking about the couple of optional modules that we've made available with launch for SAS Boost. So the first is billing integration, and this is completely optional, but what we've uh, started with is an integration with Stripe. And you start the process by going into your Stripe account and you get a developer API key from Stripe. And then you give that API key to SAS Boost as part of your application setup, as part of your configuration. And what that does is that will then trigger saving subscription plans uh, in SAS Boost to the products that are over in Stripe under your account. And so now that we have this link, when you onboard a new tenant, you can subscribe them to a billing plan. And you can stop there, and what that would give you would be uh, subscription-based billing. So that is a dollar amount for a time range. Now, if you choose to, if you want to, you can further enhance the system by publishing custom metering events. So what's a metering event? A metering event is um, the number of calls to an API in your source code, or the amount of clock time that it took for something to run, or the amount of disk space that a tenant is consuming in your product, things like that. So operational, real-time things, uh, that, uh, that you ascribe value to and that you charge for as they are consumed. So this is a place where you could choose to go in, modify your source code, change your source code, and publish these custom metering events against the SAS Boost billing API. And then SAS Boost is gonna collect all that stuff up, aggregate it, get it in the proper format for Stripe, and then on a scheduled basis, publish that over to your Stripe account where Stripe will take care of invoicing and billing. 
The other optional module available is an analytics ingestion pipeline. So this would be to uh, ingest custom metrics. So you saw the standard metrics that you get out of the box with those dashboards. But if you want to collect custom uh, information about what's going on at runtime as your tenants utilize your application, you could choose to publish those custom metrics to this pipeline. So what we've set up is a Kinesis Data Firehose, and Firehose will save that information off to a Redshift data warehouse, where then you could use all sorts of tools to visualize it, like an Amazon QuickSight dashboard. Um, but there are lots of options for how to aggregate and visualize uh, metrics data. One example might be to use Firehose to push it to S3 and then put an Amazon Athena table on top of that and use standard SQL queries. You could also go straight to Elasticsearch and use Kibana as your visualization. So lots of options available here. So what are our takeaways for today? Well, we covered this low friction migration model uh, we went through the system architecture and how we used serverless technologies to minimize costs and make sure that we are reliable and scalable and secure. We went deep into the tenant onboarding automated workflows. We talked about the secure, isolated tenant environments that are created and how you can tweak those environments to deal with tenant load or packaging choices like tiering. You're gonna get tenant-aware operational dashboards out of the box, no touch to your code. And we showed you how easy it is to update your product and release it to all your tenants with one uh, step with your deployment pipeline. So I encourage you, go sign up for the preview of SAS Boost. Go to the link shown on this slide. Think about how you can utilize this environment to accelerate your move to SaaS. Think about what existing IP you may have today that now you could deliver as a subscription service that you hadn't been able to before. Again, we're releasing this as open source so that we can build a community around making it better for everybody. And it's just the beginning, it's just the MVP. We're so excited about all the neat things that we're gonna be able to do to improve this to help our community. SaaS Factory has put together other SaaS focused sessions, both business and technical. I encourage you to take a look at those. So thank you for taking the time today to learn about AWS SaaS Boost. Go sign up for the preview and please fill out the session survey if you can so that we know how to improve for you going forward. Thanks again.